excited today to host Shirley Wu, who is an amazing visualization designer and engineer. And I think we're ready to start. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you so much for having me uh, today as your speaker. Um, again, uh, I'm going to do something quite informal just because talks always give me a lot of stress and anxiety to prepare for. Um, and so I try to keep that to a minimum every year. Uh, but I do really, really enjoy talking to like university classes and clubs. So um, my like trade off is or my, my kind of yeah, my trade off is that uh, uh, I'm really happy to take these on, but just not as a talk and just kind of an informal chat. So again, um, if at any point uh, you have any questions about anything I'm talking about, please ask me. Um, but in the meantime, I have a huge list of questions I get to go through. So I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Shirley and uh, I am a freelance, I am self-employed, independent, whatever it's called, um, uh, designer slash engineer. Uh, and I specialize on data visualizations for the web. Um, and my background is in software engineering, but in the last four years of freelancing and working for different clients, I've uh, I've kind of expanded that skill set to include kind of information design and a light bit of data analysis. Honestly, data science really intimidates me, so I claim nothing, <laughs> like absolutely no skill in data science. Um, but I do do like um, I do my own data collection and I do some form of like ad hoc data analysis, and then I do the design and uh, the implementation slash coding for the web for my clients as well as on some personal projects so this is like a quick um i guess look through my portfolio um and these are some of my ran uh my uh recent projects and i do both client projects and kind of like personal um self-motivated projects as well um, and so the first question I have is, how did you become interested in data visualization? Um, and so that one is, I think the most straightforward answer is that my first job out of college was as a software engineer, a front end software engineer at a big data company called Splunk. And um, I was on their uh, apps team. So I ended up uh, on the team that was kind of building dashboards for um the uh the kind of the ui um and that's where i actually learned d3 um and so i i actually got into data visualization from the code side through d3 which is a javascript library for uh, creating data visualizations on the web and then slowly as i got more into it i got involved in the local bay area d3 user group which is like this uh little meetup uh and that's how I learned about data visualization. Um, and when I learned about data visualization, because before I was just playing with D3, I didn't know that there was such a thing called data visualization. And I already really loved D3 because it combines code, which I love, um, math and geometry, which I uh, forgotten that I loved, but uh, apparently I love geometry. Um, and then I actually also, uh, did art and painting uh, for 14 years of my life before university. So I've always really enjoyed art. Um, and so D3 uh, combined those three things for me. And then I learned about data visualization, which uh, I think also encompasses the things that I said before about data and data analysis and design. Um, also very much enjoy design. And that's when I realized like I really really enjoy this practice in this field um, because it's a combination of all the things that I've always enjoyed growing up. So that's how I became interested. And in terms of what training I went through to get to where I am now, um, so like I said, I uh, studied, so I studied, uh, I guess, uh, I actually studied business in university uh, and then I, um, minored in computer science and then when I graduated I went to and I became a software engineer and that was uh, a lot of um, my coding background comes from when I was at full-time jobs and I did I used a lot of d3 I used a lot of uh, react uh, and backbone which is these javascript libraries uh, for creating uh, 
applications, web applications, um, and managing the UI. So a lot of my training is very deeply in computer, like software engineering. And then, um, and then uh, I think I draw a lot from my art background from when I was younger. Uh, and that's when I learned about like color theory. I learned a lot about uh, layout and uh, composition. And I also did a little bit of graphic design in university. Um, and I think also the, uh, the uh, business background helps me a little bit from like a like you user experience design perspective of like products thinking. Um, and so all of those together um, kind of led me where to where I am now. Um, and then the last four years of doing freelance, uh, the way that I've kind of taught myself information design is through some books, um, reading some books. Uh, my favorite is The Functional Art by Alberto Cairo. Um, and then I think just looking at other people's data visualizations um, and then data analysis, I kind of like gained ad hoc uh, through just doing like dozens of projects and figuring out what works and does not work. Um, so I also saw some flashing in the chat. I don't know if those are questions or anything, um, but uh, I think it would be helpful if uh, you just interrupt me because I like can't manage the chat also <laughs> if there are questions. Handle the chat, you don't have to worry about it. So it's just announcement, like if there's a dog fair, they can add questions. And cool. there was some praise about you being nervous, so don't be nervous, that's all. Nothing else. Sorry, what? Nothing, nothing. That's just oh. a dog with a question. Anybody can interrupt anytime if they want to ask question. Don't forget to unmute yourself uh, before asking question. That's all. Yeah. So um, in terms of my favorite tools for visualization, um, like I said, I do this all in the web um, just because I think the web is great for communication. Um, I mean, data visualization is basically a communication tool of um, like, I look through the data, I analyze it, there's some interesting things that I want to tell other people, um, and that's why I create a visualization. And so the web is great because then I can like put, publish it and then anybody can see it. Um, and so uh, the things that I use is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's D3JS. So this is probably the, um, de facto, I would say, JavaScript library for creating visualizations. Um, and then I know that there is a lot of kind of libraries that have been built on top to kind of um, abstract away some of the, so I would think of D3 as like a very low level uh, JavaScript library for manipulating um, HTML elements and creating these different shapes that eventually lead to visualizations. Um, and then there's a lot of like higher level um libraries that have been created on top of d3 uh, that kind of give you the charts uh in a much more accessible way but i tend to like just using d3 itself because i like the very like low level fine grain control that gives me so this is the library that i use basically every single project um and also almost every single project i use lodash which is um another javascript library that helps me with it just has a lot of utility functions and so it really helps me with like data manipulation and then um these days i really enjoy using vue.js which is a javascript library that helps me kind of manage user interaction and how that propagates around the web page. So if somebody uh, interacts with this part of my visualization, it might actually affect uh, the, uh, that visualization as well as like another visualization maybe. And that's where I like to use Vue. And finally, um, I like to, some of my um, work has animations. So I really like to use this library called Greenstock Animation Platform. Um, extremely powerful and helps make creating animations on the web extremely accessible and easy. Yeah, so those are probably the four tools that are almost always my go-tos and I just use it in some sort of combination depending on what I'm trying to achieve with the project. Uh, and, um, and then I'll also have some one-off 
maybe node packages I use to help me with that particular project. But these four I use almost always. So um, even in my portfolio, I'll say like it's built with D3 and Greensock or D3 Vue and Greensock. Um, I used to use React, which is another JavaScript library like Vue, um, but I've now replaced that with Vue. So um, yeah, always D3 React Greensock. And um, oh, sure, can sorry, I yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Daria. Um, so when you're working on a project or you're just starting a project, do you start off with like pen and paper? At what point do you find iterating with code easier? Is it very like project dependent? Um, that's something that I sometimes struggle with with my projects because I'm not sure like, hmm, okay, now it's time to code instead of designing every single bit of it. Yeah, that's a really great question. And that's something that like uh, I've sh kind of like struggled with and then uh, finally kind of landed on for in the last four years. So I actually have this project called Data Sketches with my friend Nadi. And so this project is uh, we chose 12 different uh, topics and then we both each went out and got uh, our our own data for it and then we collected so we clicked our own data and analyzed and then we um, designed and coded so the whole process and the reason why I bring this up is because through this project um, I think I kind of really grew in that sense of um, when I was first oh sorry hold on and I bring this up because uh, we have write-ups of our whole process on every single one of these projects so these are the end projects. So let me show you. Um, so something, uh, this is my project called Film Flowers. And this is basically, I mapped summer blockbuster movies uh, to different attributes of a flower. Um, and so this one um, was a pretty straightforward project. So actually, sorry, TLDR um, is uh, to answer your question, uh, when it is a relatively simple data set and the visualization itself is also simple, like something like this, where, you know, I'm just directly mapping data to the visuals, uh, I tend to just do pen and paper, um, sketch it out, and uh, it's, uh, so you can see, I just like sketch out some different ideas, and then I'm able to translate it directly to code. So this, this half, um, and then I kind of just iterate after that with the code. Um, other times though, when the data set is super huge, so this particular one I think only had 100 something movies, so it was a very straightforward project in terms of the design. Um, the fun part was just really trying to figure out like a fun visual encoding. Um, but I've also had, uh, let's see, I think the one that really taught me, let's see, was which one was it uh oh okay so this one i think is the first time um i realized that uh for bigger data sets um i not only needed to first sketch out my ideas on pen and paper because that's always the easiest way to like get my ideas out and um as i've gotten older i've just realized my memory has gotten worse and so i just need to like get my ideas out um but even when i've gotten my ideas out um because sometimes my data set is so big, um, I can't predict how it will look. Um, and so I need to, so I, this is where I was like, you know, playing around with different ideas. And ultimately I was like, oh, I'll maybe do something like this, uh, where I'm just going to try out the simple bar chart like thing, or not like a little chart where, you know, the x-axis is um, when I took the photo, so this data set is uh, my travel photos, um, their colors, and when, and then I had some metadata on them. And I was like, oh, I'll map it this way. And it turned out like this, which is really ugly <laughs> um, and not at all like a finished product. And this is the time when I learned um, that I needed to uh, really dig in and analyze my data before I could go on with the coding. Um, and then the final big lesson I learned was that um, sometimes, and I try my best with like analyzing data sets, uh, but because I don't have that background, this one I really struggled with. So this one was with Google 
and um, it was Google search data from 2004 to 2017. And I narrowed it down to, again, travel, um, but it was so massive that I couldn't grok my mind around it or analyze it in a meaningful way. And this is when I went back and forth between um, the sketch and design, or sorry, the design and code a lot. So I would like start with an idea and I would implement it and be like, mm, that's not that great. And then I would like go back and like sketch another idea and be like, oh, that's not that great either. And then like different ideas and I would like go, I like tried a lot of different ideas. And then finally I was like, oh, um, this, this, this works. Um, and was able to find and like get to my final visualization. Um, and so sometimes I think when my data set is so big, um, I tend to like to switch between that design, um, design and code just because um, I can't predict. So when I'm designing, I can't predict the shape of my data, how my data will be, like what is interesting in my data until I put it on the screen. So it really depends within that like gradient of like how complicated or simple or how big or small my data set is. Yeah, I've also since like this was also just a really silly way of doing things because I literally kind of just coded from scratch every single visualization I was interested in. So since then, I've also learned to use something like um, I now use. So in this one, um, I try out Vega Light, um, which is a, a project from University of Washington, um, and it just uh, gives me, I can use some like JSON structures and then it will just give me like really quick sets of charts um, and now I use that for my analysis so that I don't have to build things from scratch anymore. Yeah, that was a very long answer, but it, it was just because uh, it's a really great question that uh, took me about like three years to figure out. That's super helpful, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have I have another question if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I, I jump in. Hi, Charlie and Mariah. Um, thanks so much. It's it's great to have you. Um, Thank you. Um, sharing some insights with us. And one of the things I would love to hear from you is if you could talk through one of your projects and what it was like as a freelancer to go from sort of start to end. And I don't I don't know maybe like your your um, like the bust out project that you did with the Guardian. Like, what is it like, you know, how, you know, are you, are you approached by people at the Guardian or are you pitching to them? What was it like to work with them? How do you get something into sort of the final media state? Oh, yeah. So it seems like more the freelance business side rather than the creative, um, the creative process side um, is what you're interested in? I, I, well, I guess I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested a little bit in both, probably more on the creative side, but just sort mm -hmm. of curious about what sort of, you know, the kind of, I don't want to say day in the life, but the whatever the three months in your life of you know getting one of these pieces from start to finish, what that what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, so each client project is different, um, which I guess makes sense because each client is different. Um, but for the bus out one in particular, so this is the project, um, and it is ooh. My computer is not happy with me right now. I wonder why. Let me quit some programs. So this one is a um, visualization, or we, we helped do this whole story uh, in terms of the visuals and the data analysis and uh, the web page, um, all of it. This is not loading very well, but um, so we did this for the Guardian. Um, and it was with my friend Nadia and I. So Nadia and I worked on data sketches. Um, and so for this particular project, um, the Guardian reached out to Nadi. Um, okay, please just watch this on your on your own devices. I don't know. I think it's like either the combination of Zoom and I have no idea why it's so slow, but. Um, it's, I promise, a lot more performance than this. Um, so what happened with the Guardian was uh, they had reached out to Nadi because they were looking for um, freelancers uh, to help visualize this data set that they have been collecting for a year and a half. Um, and that data set being um, how homeless people traveled or there's a program in the US called that's like homeless relocations where cities um, 
help cities buy bus tickets, um, and in the case of New York, buy plane tickets for uh, homeless people to go somewhere else. Um, the official reason for this is so is uh, that, or the official reasoning for it is that you know if homeless people can get a bus ticket to another place where they have friends or family members, especially family members, that those family members would be able to take care of them better. So, so the bus tickets must always be bought um, where there's an a, like a family member on the other side. Um, but uh, you know through this investigation, there's uh, there's uh, it reveals a lot. So um, to do that, uh, the Guardian uh, collected all of the data for a year and a half. And when they were about ready to kind of like start on producing the story, um, they reached out to Nadi and Nadi realized uh, that um, given that her background is in data science and then she has, and then she now focuses on data visualization, um, that she can do the data part really well, the data analysis part really well, but that um, she needed someone that would, could help with the web, producing the web page, the web story. And so she brought me in. Um, and so I think that was, we launched the project in August of 27, sorry, we started on the project on August of 2017. Um, and so the Guardian had been collecting for like a year and a half before that. Um, and then Nadi had gone, I think, two or three weeks of, you know, going through the data, cleaning the data because um, you, if you can imagine, the data was collected from all these different cities and um, like all of the formats are different. Sometimes it was like scanned from PDF and then like people like manually, like, you know, there were reporters that manually entered those in um, from the PDF in by hand into Excel or something like that. So Nadi just spent like three weeks cleaning the thing and then making sure that all of the cities were named correctly um, and then analyzing it. And then in September, we uh, actually got together um, with the editors and spent two days um, brainstorming on the visuals. So um, yeah, and that in those two days, we kind of really fleshed out exactly what the story outline would be. And we fleshed out, um, so the, the editors uh, kind of uh, brought the story and then we kind of given those stories uh, proposed different visualizations and by the end of the two full days like we had the visuals agreed on and then we kind of went home again and Nadia and I implemented our uh, our uh, visualizations and that took I think another month or so month and a half to two I think by like October or November October or so it was October or November it was implemented and then <laughs> And then I spent another month making sure that the web page um, had no bugs, um, or yeah, made no bugs on their website uh, within there because they have like their own framework of how they publish visual stories, um, and on mobile web, and the best part on their mobile app, which is. Uh, this little web view in, inside of their iOS and Android apps. Um, so this one was probably one of the most challenging client projects I've had, just because um, I think they rightfully so had a really high standard for their stories. Um, and, uh, and that was really fun to meet because like they, they were so rigorous in the way that they like presented their stories and told their stories. And I learned a lot from that. But it was extremely painful to debug on iOS and Android devices uh, on their kind of like test app. So like they're like not their production mobile apps, but like on their test apps that I had no access to because I'm not a Guardian employee. So I literally like I had to <laughs> I had to just like sit by my editor for like days using his credentials in their office testing. <laughs> so yeah, that was the whole process. Overall, like such a great uh, experience, but I don't think I want to do the last two weeks of that ever again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, let me uh, go through 
Um, oh, so um, there was a great question that was, uh, if I had any favorite visualization designers or engineers or people in the industry who inspire me. Um, so the first one that I've really been enjoying her work is, um, her name is Mona Chalabi. Um, she's a journalist at The Guardian, um, I think still at The Guardian. Um, and I think maybe her Instagram might be best. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but my computer is really lagging. Um, but the thing that I really love about her work is that she takes um, data uh, that is kind of, so let me actually see if I can, well, no, let's see. So she takes, she takes data sets that are often quite complex um, and about extremely sensitive topics, let's say, and then she kind of, she hand draws them in a way that I think is extremely accessible for people that aren't familiar with data at all. So let's see. Um, oh, so I think, for example, she'll do something like, yeah, average hours of training um, required for a cop versus a beautician. Um, so, well, actually, hold on. Yeah, so a lot of her recent ones have been about, ah, I enjoyed this one. <laughs> Speed of government <laughs> response to protests. Um, and so, yeah, you can, and then I think she uses the medium uh, really well. So uh, then she, it's, it's kind of satirical. Um, it's very approachable because it has this like sketchy manner. Um, you can almost say that it's, um, you, can, you can kind of say that it's not, like if Edward Tufte saw it, he probably would not approve. Um, because there's too much like ink to data ratio or something. Um, but I think I really love the way that she condenses um, really difficult topics into um, kind of bite-sized approachable things. So she's one of the people that I wanted to share. Um, I've also from a, uh, I also have been enjoying the things that uh, her name is. Is today. So hold on. Data viz today. There we go. So um, it's by uh, a woman named Ali Torben, um, and she gives. She has this podcast called Data Viz Today where she does like really bite-sized, like 15 minute to 20, 30 minute um, episodes. And a lot of them are almost case study-like. And I just think that she presents them really, really well. So I really like her work also from a learning perspective. Um, I think she gives a really great uh, um, potential entry point if you're interested in data visualization um, and uh, you want to like listen to a podcast about it because she um, she starts from the perspective of someone that doesn't do data visualization and wants to get into it. So every episode is her exploring different um, visualization projects and what she learned from them. There's another very prominent one um, called Data Stories, um, and that one has been established and. Uh, you know, it's been going on for years and they're at like 180 episodes or something, which is a little bit intimidating. Um, also a great podcast, but I recommend this one for if you want to like get into it, um, into visualization and you're looking for a place to start. Um, so those are the two people that come to the top of my mind immediately for the work that I really like, what they're doing right now. And then um, I was asked to uh, share about some of my particular pieces. So I already shared data sketches earlier. Um, let's see. And then um, I think one of the pieces of interest, so um, the film flowers was one of the pieces of interest. 
um, which is this one. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, some more blockbusters. And some of my favorites is Dark Knight Rises. I think it's really pretty. Um, so the bigger the flower, it means the better rated they were. So this is, um, they were, so the bigger the flower, they're high, the higher their rating out of 10. The colors are the genres. Um, number of petals is number of IMDb votes and the petal shapes are their uh, parental guidance ratings. So really like Dark Knight Rises. I think Inception is really pretty. Um, I really personally like the Harry Potter series. Um, but the one that I always share uh, for every, like every time I talk about this project is my absolute favorite is the 1997 Batman and Robin because it's so tiny and cute. <laughs> and just like this tiny little flower. Yeah, so this is my film flowers project. Um, I don't know if there was any specific questions about it. Um, it's just, um, I was, I think, Maybe it was Pranav that uh, suggested it. Um, I have a good question, actually. So yeah. how do you determine the shape for the different flowers? Because some of the flowers don't have the same design. Yeah, so do you mean the different, what the different uh, petals represent or? Uh, so like, how did you do the mapping for like the reading to the different petals? So this is actually one of my very first projects after I went freelance and there was absolutely no thought process to um, the visual encoding and I was like just so this is my like trying to work out so so this project was me trying to learn how to draw shapes on on the web which is done with um, something called SVG and um, it's actually really fun because it's uh, it's very mathematical um, in how to draw each of these shapes. So I was just trying to learn that technical aspect. Um, so it's like you draw a line and then you draw a curve and then for the curve, you, you just specify different points. Um, and I literally was trying to just come up with interesting shapes uh, that I can implement and then draw um, from a learning perspective. So. Um, I ultimately landed with these four and I randomly assigned the parental guidance ratings to them. So um, shamefully, there's no uh, meaning to like in terms of the data versus the visual encoding. Um, and since then, uh, through my projects, another thing I've really learned and enjoy employing now is um, trying to uh, create a visual metaphor. So um trying to tie my visuals and having a callback to what the data is so um for example when my data set is about music so i did one about hamilton and the musical um the uh visual inspiration i got was uh like musical sheets like uh kind of musical sheet notes notation um and so eventually i now learned to really uh, place importance on visual and visual metaphors. Yeah. So actually, let me show the Hamilton piece because I think there were a few more questions um, about that one. So this is one I did a few years ago about Hamilton the musical. And Each of these dots represents a series of uh, lines, series of lyrics sung by a particular uh, a particular character in the musical. And they are colored. Hold on, will you give me like a few seconds to figure out what is making my, what is making my computer lag so hard? And see if I can delete that. And it seems to tell me that it is Zoom that is making my computer lag so hard. So, 
I don't think I can do anything about that. Actually, Shirley, you can, this is Carolina, um, you can, when you stop share, sharing your screen and then you go share it again, at the very bottom, there's optimized for video um, sharing, oh. and that will make it a little, degrade the performance of the, it's going to make it a little pixelated, but it will make it more responsive. So oh, just, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, wait, so at the very so bottom, there's a little checkbox. Ah, uh, wait. It doesn't let me check it. Oh, maybe that's, well, then it might be a hosting. Hmm. I wonder if that's because. One idea is not... also you can maybe turn off your video. If Actually, or, or if, in fact, if you can make her co-host, I'm sure she'll be able to click that. Yeah, and... yeah. I'm seeing how to do that. So I'm going to stop video also, just in case. Uh. Yeah, actually, as soon as I stopped sharing video, <laughs> the performance got much better. Or sharing screen, I'm sorry, sharing screen. Yeah, but I think you can share the screen and maybe not the video, that would be better. Yeah, so I can make me... you host, but... Let me try again. I'm going to just try sharing again. Oh, that is smoother. Yeah, yeah. I think oh my I, gosh, it really was just sharing my video. <laughs> yeah, you don't need my video. Uh, it just, yes. Okay. This is what it's supposed to look like. Um, this looks so much smoother. Okay. This is much more important, um, that you see this and not my face. Um, so yes, so this is a visualization of every line in Hamilton and each of these dots, uh, represents a, um, a set of lyrics. And then as you scroll through, um, I present uh, to you the analysis I did and the things that I learned. So these are, again, oh, and then um, you can filter by um, any set of characters to see what uh, lyrics remain. And then um, I kind of give you, uh, like I, I, I have some write-ups about what I learned. And then I also present um, the analysis I did about different um, different recurring themes in the musical. Um, and you can filter by those also. And at the very end, I present the, um, the filter tool, the visual tool that I created and used for my analysis so that um, people can do their own analysis as well. So for this particular one, um, what I was saying earlier was that um, these little uh, notations, um, I actually struggled. So there is here. Um, this is my whole write-up about uh, my process. And if you're interested in all the different ways <laughs> and things I tried, uh, it's, it's all here. Um, and what I was saying earlier about visual notation is that I really struggled uh, in terms of figuring out how to, um, how to get across these recurring themes and where they were in the lyrics in a visual way that was kind of straightforward and easy to see. Um, and the first time, a few times I tried it, I tried these like different triangles um, and then I colored them as a way of distinguishing, which is um, really confusing, um, very visually kind of um, cluttered because then that meant that I was also um, double encoding color by both the characters. So I used color to denote which character, but I was also using color to denote which, um, which uh, recurring theme. And that just made the visualization down here super cluttered. 
Um, and then it wasn't until I had the small aha moment of, oh, um, Hamilton is a musical. So musicals remind me of sheet music. Um, and so this is where I was writing it down. And then I was like, oh, maybe I can have these be like, you know, uh, these themes, maybe I can denote them like how you might denote, um, I, I don't do, I don't do music. So um, I, I just kind of looked up sheet music and then I saw these kind of like little lines and, um, and then I was like, oh, this, this would be a really great way to denote um, these recurring phrases. And then I was like, oh, maybe I can use these like staff um, lines uh, to denote, you know, how many lines of lyrics there are. And eventually that was like, oh, that feels too cluttered. So it ended up being like this. So um, I think since this project and a few other projects, it's become really important to me to do visual metaphors. Um, and another visual metaphor, actually, now that, now that I'm the, now that performance is okay. Okay, so for bust out, um, so there is another place um, where um, the visual metaphor was the, this visualization is about homeless relocations from New York City. And um, we had two very specific goals for this one. The first one being, um, we wanted to show uh, the longest journey uh, from New York City. So basically the longest, uh, the furthest away place that New York City bought a plane ticket for, which was New Zealand. And then we also wanted to show the most common destinations that um, homeless people relocated to. Um, and for this particular visualization, I think the easy, the most kind of like straightforward answer would have been a map because we are mapping one geographic location to another geographic location. Um, but we wanted to do something a little bit different, um, especially because we have already presented a map up here. So we wanted, and we didn't want to do maps twice. And so for this one, the visual metaphor is um, of a person, um, of a person kind of, you know, taking off, getting on a flight and taking off and landing at their destination. So that's why it's these little arcs. And then each person is a dot along that arc that lands. And as each time they land, the circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's another way that I employed visual metaphors. Um, so yeah, so that's one piece. And for the, inter for the Hamilton piece, I got a few questions about, um, let's see, about my uh, design process and technical workflow, um, which I think I've talked about a little bit, um, a little bit earlier. So um, I think maybe unless there's like very specific questions, um, I also have basically all of my process written up here. Um, this, by the way, is my favorite bug that I've ever made uh, while coding. I call this my accidental Jackson Pollock because um, if you wait a little bit, there we go. This is my Jackson Pollock. Um, and I also had a question about when you are working on a visualization project, how do you think about and design layouts to represent your data? Um, and so I think that one uh, again, is very much um, nowadays, I think a lot about the visual metaphor about how can I clue in um, whoever my reader is or my audience is, how can I use my visualization um, and the visual encodings I choose to clue my reader into what the underlying data set, data set might be. And uh, I also have, I think this is a technical question, but how did I determine the clusters? And so the question is about these particular clusters. And so these are clustered by uh, song. And for this particular one, I used the D3 force layout, um, which is an implementation of the force, force, draw, force, algorithm, force graph algorithm. I can't, I can't remember that. Force directed, uh, force directed graph drawing. Um, and that one is basically when you have nodes and links, um, 
the for there is like a certain set of forces that are applied. So some of the forces could be that um, nodes repel each other while links um, uh, attract uh, links bring uh, nodes together, so links attract nodes. Um, and I actually have a whole write-up about um, how the force-directed layout is implemented in D3. So the, that is somewhere. Oh, there we go. So um, this one I wrote uh, about, yeah, D3 and how um, how it works and how it's implemented. Yeah, so this this part is kind of the important part about how does it work. Um, and this is a uh, earlier represent or earlier implementation of the D3 force layout. So the D3 force layout has since changed a little bit in implementation, but the core theory is the same. Then, um, can you explain the importance of interaction in your work and what you think it adds to understanding the data sets you visualize? Yeah, so for me, and this is a little bit controversial of a note because I think some people are very much about presenting the data, all of the data at once so that we don't expect, we don't have to rely on our readers to uh, realize that there's interaction at all. So like, for example, there's a lot of interaction here in that you can hover to see the different, um, the different lyrics and um there's one school of thought that is like you should present all of your data visually um and so there's like no nothing hidden and nothing for uh your reader to try and guess at um so that's one school of thought and i think there's a lot of merit to it but for me personally i've always kind of enjoyed um putting in layers to my work um and so i've always tried my best to make my work such that um, if my readers never realize there's any sort of interaction, that I've still provided them some amount of value. So for example, for this one, um, this piece, it's that I, even if they never tried to hover, which I mean, like if they just move their mouse a little bit, then then they can realize they can hover. Um, there's interaction here in that um, they can click around and do reset to like figure out how this filtering works. But if they never do that, then hopefully I've still given them some sort of um, valuable insight in the, uh, the, the kind of writing I've done. Um, but for the people that like really wanted to dig in, um, then I give them kind of another layer of all these different, all these kind of interactions of being able to filter and really dig into the data set. Um, and so I like to add those kind of layers of hopefully um, at the very top layer, if they never interact, they still get something. They still are able to walk away with some new knowledge about the data set. But um, if they do decide to dig in, um, then they're rewarded with much more. Um, and that's what I like about um, putting in interaction. And of course, there's sometimes um, the intention, like this one is so simple, there is no interaction. The only interaction is that if they click on a movie, it takes them to the IMDb page. But and sometimes like a data set is that simple and what I want to do with it is that simple. Um, but sometimes when a data set is super rich, um, it uh, I think merits a lot of interaction. For the bust out one, um, the, uh, the editors were very, very, um, they, they um, did not want any sort of interaction because for them, um, they knew that uh, a lot of their readers wouldn't want wouldn't click on anything so they wanted all of the information to be presented on scroll through these animations so it also really depends on um like the audience and how likely they are to dig in and oh and then i guess the last little thing um i will say I'm, I'm not quite sure how long i have i'm guessing until the end of this hour but uh the last mm -hmm project i'll share is this one this is my most recent one so uh, there is a question to... uh if oh, Kenan yeah. can go and ask can i are you there yeah um yeah a question about just going from contract to contract especially early on um how were you contacting people um to say like i would like to do data visualization for you or i know you're doing a project um, oh. especially early on and even these days, is it all people contacting you? Yeah, so uh, 
so for my freelancing, you mean like how do I approach clients or do clients approach me? Yes. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so when I first started out, I actually did try to approach a few clients. Um, but what I quickly realized that because was that because data visualization is such, well, when I started was 2016. So back then data visualization still wasn't that widely known. And for a lot of companies, they weren't sure what it was. And more, more importantly, because they weren't sure what it was, um, they didn't know, they didn't, they didn't have any budget set aside for it. So the quickest thing I realized when I started freelancing was that um, a conversation will lead to nowhere, no contract will get signed unless there's budget set aside um, for it. And so like there needs to be intention um, in terms, so yeah, so the client needs to have intention um, of they realize what a data visualization is. They realize that it's very important for them, and they and then they have to, you know, convince everybody else in the org to set aside money for it, and then they can hire me. Um, and so I quickly realized that um, I have very low success rate pitching potential clients on um, a data visualization project. So. Um, I very early on, I concentrated all my effort on establishing my portfolio because the great thing about visualization is that it's extremely visual. Um, and uh, given the internet, like as long as I have my portfolio site, like it's very easy for potential clients, even if they not know nothing about code, even if they know nothing about data analysis, they can see my portfolio and be like, oh, she's done some things like she can execute. Um, and then data sketches also helps a lot because it's like another form of my portfolio where uh, potential clients can see like not only the end projects, but like be able to see all the process um, that I've gone through and be like, oh, like she's, she's like legit enough to be able to, you know, <laughs> implement what we want. So, um, so early on, I started kind of uh, putting all of my effort into making, try my best so that clients can find me rather than the other way around. So these portfolio projects have worked a lot. I've since uh, spoken uh, at um, a lot of different conferences. And so um, I think people will see my conference talks and then um, they might not have a project for me right away because again, um, an organization needs a budget. And, but then, you know, like months down the line or years down the line, uh, their company needs some sort of visualization. They'll be like, oh, I saw Shirley at this conference and they'll reach out to me. Or um, I've since done a lot of podcasts and interviews or I've, I've, um, I've had like the honor of going on people's podcasts. And so that's helped a lot. Um, so it really has just been putting my work out there that has helped clients reach out to me. And um, having said that, um, I've been doing this for um, four years. And in the last year, I've kind of tried to shift uh, my approach. Um, and I've actually tried to shift it into uh, pitching clients again. And the reason for this is um, I realized, I think by year, so the first year, um, I struggled a lot just putting my name out there. But after, uh, I think the first seven months or so, I like my projects were starting to get me enough clients that I felt pretty steady. And then I reached a point maybe a year and a half ago where I realized that um, I was starting to be a bit more picky about the projects I take on. Like I um, started to care a lot more about the topics and um, you know, who the potential audience was. Um, and then I wanted to do, I wanted to work on stories that um, I really cared and were, was passionate about. And so that's how I started kind of, now I try to reach out to clients again. Um, and I try to kind of pitch them on particular stories. Um, it's still not successful all the time, but I am having better success than when I first started because unlike when I first started, I have more of a portfolio and more of a reputation to kind of go off of. So I'm um, still not very successful in reaching out to clients, but more successful than when I first started. So yeah. Um, and I guess uh, to wrap up, um, I had uh, uh, this one. Your people of the pandemic again, uh, please. Sorry, what? Uh, can we talk about the people of the pandemic to wrap yeah. up? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, so this project is one I did back in April. And the goal for this one is to um, kind of center the um, numbers from the pandemic um, to an individual's local experience. Um, and the kind of asterisk disclaimer is that um, because, you know, um, back in April and even now, we don't know enough about COVID-19. So we tried to make a more simplified model um, to, you know, kind of simulate how a virus might uh, go through a community. And if you're interested, um, I got to work with a really great data scientist um, and he wrote up all of the methodology um, here of all of the decisions we made, um, if you're interested in reading that. But essentially, we can, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna enter in my own zip code, but I'm gonna put in this, uh, I'm gonna choose an urban community and then I'm gonna say start playing. And uh, so immediately there's some um, status bars about how much food and the exercise happiness. And then some community numbers about how many uh, hospital beds are getting filled. And uh, each week you uh, make a decision of how many times you go out. So I think I went out once, uh, twice for food uh, this past week. I uh, have not gone outside for exercise, I've not gone out for any gatherings. Uh, and then you can see how other people in your community decided. And so this other people in your community is actually 19 other real people that have played this game um, and, and their decisions. And then you can see that there, this is a very specific zip code and there's a very specific population um, and uh, a very specific age breakdown from that population and very specific set of hospitals that we're pulling all of this data from. Um, so that is the uh, game um, that I built back in April. And then if you play this all the way through, um, actually, I'm just gonna do that really quickly. Um, it kind of shows you, I think at the end of five weeks, um, we kind of show you, um, like, look, here's the numbers um, in your community right now. Like, what would it look like if we suddenly everybody uh, went back to business as usual? Um, and so this was a visualization project um, that was really important to me um, because of what, the, you know, a lot of the the pandemic not being taken seriously back in March um, and a lot of you know the numbers feeling potentially really big um, and kind of uh, and I wanted to create like a um, a experience centered around one specific person and the community that they might be in. Um, and so this one was interesting because um, I wanted to contrast this project with the Hamilton project because um, there was the question about kind of workflow and getting your data set um, from the Hamilton one. And for that one, for the Hamilton one, it was all about kind of going through the lyrics and manually entering the data. Um, but there was a solid data set. And this project was really interesting because there was no data set. We made a very conscious decision to not use any of the data sets that were available back in March and April because we knew that um, there was a lot of messiness and faults in the data collection process for COVID-19. And um, you know, each different country was collecting the information differently, like the tests weren't being given out uh, as much as it should in the US or there was a lot of messiness. So we, we were very conscious about not using uh, the data sets available. And instead we made a very conscious decision to um, you know, employ a set of fictitious numbers. Um, but these fictitious numbers are based on um, we, uh, I worked with a data scientist and he actually has a public health background. We also consulted with a um, epidemiologist. So we got these numbers as close to the R naught of COVID-19 as we could. Um, and that was a very interesting process of, I think this might be one of the first times I worked 
not with an actual data set, but a model. Um, and so that was personally interesting for me. And um, there's a, another question that I thought was really important um, that I put under this people of the pandemic, which was, what are your thoughts on the importance of visualization? Um, and actually before this pandemic, I would have thought that like visualization is really great for communicating um, ideas and uh, meaning or patterns in the data set. Um, but I didn't think it was, you know, the most important thing in the world. Uh, but through the pandemic, I realized, um, especially in this age where we have so much data, um, I think this pandemic is uh, one of the natural disasters in my living memory that we have so much data available um, that I realized how important visualization actually is. Like there, we've seen so many charts about COVID-19 and the number of cases and the number of mortalities. Um, and this is all because in terms of, um, I read, I think from a public, public health official saying that um, the most important, one of the most important parts of preventing the, uh, you know, the spread of a disease, uh, of a new disease is um, convincing the public of its uh, danger before there's any apparent danger. And so that communication part I think was done a lot through a visualization this time around. And that's when I realized like, oh, like this visualization, data visualization is actually really important. And we, we do have, especially if we're creating for the public, we do have very much of a responsibility to make sure that it is done to the best of our ability and done as honestly and as clearly as we could. And there's another like kind of follow-up question that is like, do you think there's a lot of bias in visualization? Um, and I kind of lumped it under this project because I think um, we've seen how, because of this like wide availability of uh, COVID-19 data sets, um, people just kind of like plopping it in charts for, um, because, because we could, um, because the technology is there and the data set is there. Um, and, uh, and it's done in a very irresponsible way. Um, and I think it's extremely important that every time we visualize something and put it out in the public, that we, um, before we even do that, that we consider where the data came from, what sort of bias went into the data collection process, um, what bias are we putting into the visualizations, um, and are we making sure that the visualization has, you know, a clear methodology, like a clear, you know, uh, like a clear communication of what the problems with the data set might be, the uncertainty of the data set, um, and all of those. And I think it's extremely, it's an extremely important responsibility that we have whenever we're trying to communicate with the public about any data set. So yeah. Um, I think that was, uh, I think that was all of the questions. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we're ready to do like a Q and A, if that's okay with you, Shirley. Uh, like a, yeah. Like maybe five minutes, if you have. One. Yes. So maybe five minutes, um, because I need to eat lunch. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So does anyone have any questions for Shirley quickly? Uh, so I have a, a quick short one. Um, with the movies, some mm -hmm. of them have leads. Ah, uh, yes. But yes, I didn't that's, see at the top about that. Yes, that's my little Easter egg. Uh, it's, and um, those leaves, uh, it's just for me, uh, those leaves mean whether I've seen this, uh, whether I've seen the movie and whether I saw it in theaters. Um, that's all it means uh, because the original motivation for this movie was a personal one because um, I've always been really bad at pop culture references and my uh, theory was that I hadn't watched enough movies and so <laughs> that's why I did this project to see what the top movies were for each year that I've been alive. Uh, and then uh, I made a little personal thing where I denoted, you know, 
um, with leaves. And it turned out, I think I only, I've only watched like 17% of these blockbusters or something like that. Um, but yeah, so the reason why I don't kind of denote what the leaves are is because it's just a personal thing that uh, doesn't have anything to do with the actual data set, but I'm always very happy when someone asks me about it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. There's actually, it seems like in that document, a question now about how or where do you gather the third party data? Does data regulation law restrict your creation? Um, yeah, so that's something that's also very interesting, which is um, for my own personal projects, I tend to stick with um, what I like to call unproblematic data sets in um, that, you know, nobody's going to come after me for gathering uh, data sets about films, or this one is about Olympic data sets. I mean, sorry, Olympic diving. This one is uh, my personal travel record. Um, so personal projects, I tend to stay within the realm of like, um, there's no nothing, no regulation around it. It's all publicly available data. Um, but when I am interested in kind of more, let's say, hard to access data, um, that's when I prefer working with like potentially clients or um, I really like working with um, journalists uh, because they have not only the access to potential access to some of the more difficult to get uh, data sets, but also um, they uh, are just really rigorous and really great at what they do. Um, I don't personally know off the top of my head about data regulation law. I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna take a guess to mean like about privacy and such um, and anonymizing data sets. Um, and I personally work with data sets that doesn't have to do with like, you know, any sensitive information. And then um, when I am interested in one, again, like I try to ex work with experts um, that know how to kind of anonymize or privatize the data set uh, uh, as they should be. Um, so just because I know that like, mm, that I just know that I don't know <laughs> um, perfectly how some sensitive data sets should be treated. So I would rather defer to an expert on that one. Yeah. Great. So I think um, if it's okay, we should maybe wrap up the talk. Yeah, definitely. Thank you everyone for coming. It was great having everyone here. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you.